everybody. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. And today we're picking up with part two of the Misty Copsy missing persons case. Misty went missing on September 17th, 1992 from the area of the Puyallup Fair in Washington, where she spent the day with her best friend, Trina Brevard. We've already covered so much information and we have so much to still talk about. So I'm not going to give a full summary, but I will say if you haven't seen part one yet, I've linked in the description box and you should watch that first because one always comes before two and I don't know if much of today's video will make a lot of sense to you if you didn't already watch part one. So let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV, and then we'll dive right in. Many of you who have been with me for a while or even a short time know that I love Magellan TV because of the wealth of documentary films and series they offer. And I also know that many of you have joined me in making Magellan TV your go-to for real life stories that keep us entertained and educated for hours. And today I have a great three-part series on Magellan TV to recommend. It's called Who Killed Trudy Adams. Referred to as Australia's real-life Twin Peaks, the case of 18-year-old Trudy Adams is very compelling. She asked her mom to wait up for her one night when she left to go to a party at the Newport Surf Club, but she never made it home. And almost 40 years later, Trudy's disappearance remains a mystery. And I'd never heard about this case before, so everything that I found out in the three episodes was new information to me, and I really became captivated by this notorious cold case, and I honestly loved the way this series was done because they talk a lot about this area, which is Sydney's northern beaches and the history and the culture of that area. And you know that's right up my alley. It's what I like. You can watch this series and other documentary films and a series just like it on Magellan TV. All you have to do is click the link in the description box and you can try Magellan TV out for one month completely free. No strings attached. You can cancel anytime you want. But I don't think you're going to want to once you see all that Magellan TV has to offer from true crime to to history and science, travel, nature, mind and body, and so much more. There's more than enough for everyone to enjoy. The best part is you'll never run out of new and interesting things to watch because Magellan TV adds 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week. And you can watch Magellan TV on multiple platforms from your cell phone, your tablet, your computer, your smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. Do not hesitate to take advantage of Magellan TV's special offer, one month totally free to explore and enjoy all their amazing documentary series and films. Once again, all you have to do is click the link in the description box, sign up, and start watching. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video, which promises to be, once again, kind of a long one. So without further ado, let's dive in. So I want to start off today's episode revisiting what was going on with Corey Bober, the young man who'd become involved in Misty's case due to his belief that she was yet another victim of the Green River Killer, an investigation that Bober had become obsessed with for almost a decade. Remember that back in October of 1992, Corey Bober had been arrested for selling and possessing marijuana, and when he bailed out, he made it clear that he felt the police were targeting him because he'd gotten too close to a truth that they didn't want him to expose. And I personally don't disagree that the cops probably went out of their way to get dirt on Corey Bober, but I don't know if the reason they did that was because he was just too good of an armchair detective. I think it's more likely that he was annoying them and they were getting sick of him calling them out publicly for their ineptitude and making them look bad. So it was probably more retaliation than anything else. On February 25th, Corey Bober appeared in court to be sentenced on these charges that he had pleaded guilty to. And I guess he assumed since this was his first offense that he would get a light sentence, maybe even just a slap on the wrist. But that did not end up happening. And Corey Bober was actually given 14 months in prison. And he was stunned by this because he was also positive that the police needed him and his information to solve the Green River killer case. And he thought maybe they were trying to warn him or scare him by arresting him, but they wouldn't put him away in a place where he would be unable to assist in the investigation. But obviously, he was wrong. They did not ever think he had anything legitimate to add to their investigation, and they really just wanted him like out of their way where he couldn't be calling them and bothering them every single day. From prison, Corey Bo 
Gober called Diana Copsey, Misty's mother, and told her that the police would never find Misty's body without him. And unable to help himself, Corey continued to talk nonstop about his Green River Killer theories in prison. And obviously there, his only available audience were the other prison inmates who also quickly tired of him. And they began teasing him, messing with him. They would call him the Green River Killer as a cute nickname, I guess. Or maybe they thought that he was so hyper fixated on the Green River Killer case that he somehow was involved. So while Corey Bober stewed behind bars, law enforcement on the outside began to actually work on Misty's case almost six months after she went missing. I would say better late than never, but I don't really think that applies to this situation, given that the police lost the crucial first 48 hours after Misty went missing, during which her odds of being found were far greater than they ever would be again. And saying they missed the first 48 hours is being kind. They missed like, I don't know, the the first six months, you know? They really didn't do anything for six months. Now, we did talk about how Sergeant Herm Carver and Detective Mike Madison, his partner, both Puyallup police officers, had Misty's older friend, 18-year-old Reuben Schmidt, take a polygraph, and the results came back inconclusive, which was not what Reuben told Diana Copsey when he talked to her not long after. According to a letter that Diana wrote to Corey Bober while he was locked up, Reuben had told her that he'd passed his polygraph with flying colors. The day after Reuben's polygraph, Sergeant Carver and Detective Mike Madison began talking to some of Misty's friends, starting with 15-year-old Dee Dee Mills. Now, Mills let them in on a secret she had just heard from Trina Brevard a few days before. Apparently, Trina had not actually walked home from the fair as she'd been telling everyone. She'd been picked up by her boyfriend, Mike Reiner, who was 23, by the way. Have I mentioned that yet? I think a few times, but I'm going to keep saying it because Trina was 15 and Mike was 23. Let that sink in. Just let that sink in. Before re-interviewing Trina after talking to Dee Dee, Sergeant Carver pulled up Mike Reiner's record and found something interesting and chilling. Seven years prior, when Mike was 16 years old, he'd been accused of abducting and raping an 11-year-old girl at knife point. The report stated that Mike had offered the girl a ride in his car, but it appeared that these charges had never been filed. The girl eventually backed out and she didn't want to pursue anything, or whether it was her or her family, we can't quite be sure. Now, Sergeant Carver and Detective Madison spoke to Trina Brevard again on March 18th, and they told her that they wanted the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth this time, even though the truth had never seemed to interest Sergeant Herm Carver much in the past. Trina owned up to the fact that she had been lying, and she began filling in the blanks. She said she had called Mike Reiner for a ride, and she'd gotten angry when they'd been disconnected somehow. Trina also said that she'd offered Misty to ride home with Mike as well, but Misty had said no. Now, in his notes, Detective Madison wrote, quote, Trina would not be specific why Misty did not trust Reiner, but the indication was that Reiner might have come on to Misty at one time, and she did not like it, end quote. So Trina did, in fact, begin walking home, according to her. She believed, though, that Mike was going to be on his way to pick her up because she'd given him her location before they'd been disconnected, and she was right. Mike Reiner pulled up to Trina in his blue 1981 Ford Escort, and he ended up driving her home. Trina said that she had been with Mike that night for just about 10 to 15 minutes, and then he dropped her off at home and left. Mike had asked where Misty was during the drive, and Trina had informed him that Misty had decided to stay and take the bus home. Trina had actually given Misty her bus fare. Sergeant Carver and Detective Madison asked Trina if she thought that her boyfriend Mike could have dropped her off and then driven back to the fairgrounds to look for Misty. And Trina said she didn't know, but she did say she'd asked Mike that same question and he had told her he hadn't. Now, just the fact that Trina felt she needed to ask Mike that question lets me know something. It lets me know that she suspected that might have happened and she felt he was capable of doing that. Like maybe he was interested in Misty enough to actually go and do that. 
Now, it was interesting because by March, the police were doing more investigative work on Misty's case, but they were also still calling her a runaway. In the March 21st edition of the News Tribune, it said, quote, King County detectives who investigated the Green River serial murder case believe Misty Copsey's disappearance from Puyallup may be the chilling work of a serial killer. But because Puyallup police still think she's only a runaway, King County detectives have two choices. They can examine in the case themselves, or they can drop it, end quote. And in my opinion, there is some shade being thrown towards Puyallup Police by King County, and it's sprinkled throughout this article. It says that in the Green River cases, investigators had learned to quickly check out missing persons reports as possible foul play, because if you wait a week or two weeks or a month, it's hard to go back and find witnesses and details, especially physical evidence. But they also said that usually the police, like the Puyallup Police, Only closely examine a missing person's case if there's compelling evidence of foul play. And Bob Keppel, the lead investigator on the Green River case, said, quote, they'll work on them if they see somebody being dragged away by their hair, end quote. That's a little bit of shade, I think. Like, oh, the Puyallup police will investigate a missing person's case as having, you know, some potential foul play involved. But they legitimately have to, like, see it happen. They have to see an abduction happen in real time for them to do this. Our favorite person, Sergeant Herm Carver, was also quoted in this article saying, quote, we've had no one come forward to say we saw her abducted. We saw someone grab her and stick her in a vehicle. There isn't anything that would make someone think that we've got a serial murder out there preying on young girls, end quote. And so probably not even knowing that Kings County had given that statement about police having to see a victim be pulled away by their hair before they'll investigate it as a, you know, potential foul play missing persons case, Sergeant Herm Carver just like supported what they already said. Like no one has seen her be abducted. No one saw her being forced into a car. So why would we look into this as like having foul play? Or why would we look into this as a possible abduction when nobody saw an abduction happen? But the fact is Misty was 14 years old. She didn't have money. She hadn't contacted anybody. She had no place to go. Nobody had heard from her. So I think all the available evidence, circumstantial as it might be, was there to say something happened to this girl that was outside of her control. And when somebody of that young age disappears, even if you think they're a runaway, you might still want to investigate their whereabouts simply because as a runaway, they are more vulnerable. They are a part of a more vulnerable population that is, you know, liable to have some nefarious predator grab them, pick them up, or realize if they see, you know, a young runaway girl alone in the same spot for multiple days at a time, hey, This girl ran away from home. Nobody knows where she is, and she doesn't have anybody around to protect her. And for clarification, King County wasn't necessarily saying that Misty was a Green River killer victim. They realized and understood that there could and most likely was more than one killer out there operating at the same time. The article states that Jim Doyen, as well as some of his colleagues and higher-ups, believed that there were at least two killers working in the area at the time of Misty's disappearance, and Doyen believed that Misty's case was definitely connected to the other two Puyallup girls who'd been killed with their remains being left off Highway 410. The clustering of the disposal sites was usually the link that allowed investigators to group victims together and decide if they had died at the hands of the same person. The problem with serial killers is that it was impossible to know how many of them were out there and how many victims they had claimed. Sometime in the spring of 1993, Misty's mother, Diana Copsey, received a call from a person named Frank Rodriguez, who, remember, was Ruben Schmidt's boss at Adams Ribs. Frank told Diana that he had information about Ruben that the police were clearly not acting on, and he had some more information that he had not shared with Sergeant Carver and Detective of Madison, or if he had shared it with them, they had not made note of this information. Frank said that Ruben had bragged about doing something to Misty along with his 
uncle. Years later, in 2007, the News Tribune was going back through Misty's case and following up on some things, and they were able to track down Frank Rodriguez and talk to him in order to get some clarification on what Ruben had actually said. And according to the News Tribune, Frank replied, quote, just the fact that he was involved in killing her, him and this other fella, tall and lanky fella. He mentioned a family member. I think it was him and his uncle, end quote. After talking to Frank Rodriguez, Diana began to think. Ruben had told her that he'd passed his polygraph test with flying colors, but she'd only heard that fact from his mouth. And obviously, she didn't really trust him. We know that Diana was suspicious of Ruben Schmidt from day one. So Diana paid a visit to Sergeant Herm Carver just to ask him if he was still looking into Ruben as a potential suspect. And she claims he slammed his fist onto his desk really hard. It startled her. And he said, said, Reuben Schmidt did not do this. We have our man. Now, the man that Carver was referring to was Mike Reiner, Trina Brevard's much older boyfriend who'd given her a ride home from the fair that night that Misty went missing. According to March 24th notes from King County investigator Jim Doyen, Carver and Madison didn't just suspect Mike Reiner's involvement in Misty's disappearance. They told him that they thought there was an excellent possibility that Reiner could be connected to the deaths of Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibetnoy, the two Puyallup girls who went missing from the same shopping center and whose bodies turned up 100 feet away from each other two years apart. Carver believed that after Mike had dropped Trina off, he returned to the area of the fairgrounds, he located Misty, and he either convinced her to get into his car or forced her to get into his car before driving off with her. When they talked to Trina again a few days later, Later, Carver and Madison told her that they knew she said Misty didn't like or trust Mike Reiner, but Misty was probably desperate for a ride, right? She had a lot riding on this, no pun intended. Her mother had told her, like, if you mess this up, I'm never going to let you do anything like this again. And Misty was a good girl. She was responsible. And she wanted to prove to her mother that she was capable of doing something independently and following through on her promise to get a ride home and make it home safely. So Misty would have been in that moment understanding it was too far to walk home. And if she saw somebody that she knew, even if she was a little distrustful of that person, she would maybe convince herself like, oh, Mike's Trina's boyfriend. He's creepy to me and I get a little bad vibe from him. However, what what's he going to do? There's nothing. What's the worst he could do? Make a pass at me. I say no. And then he gets mad and, you know, I end up making it home anyways. So what's the big deal? What's the worst that he could do? And she would use this logic to find it in herself to accept a ride from somebody that she didn't necessarily trust. So they asked Trina, do you think it's possible? that Misty may have taken a ride from Reiner since she'd missed the bus and all of her other options had fallen through. And Trina said, maybe. So on April 6th, 1993, an undercover cop purchased Mike Reiner's blue Ford Escort for him for $200. And the undercover noticed that Reiner was anxiously cleaning garbage out of his car before turning it over. And as soon as the deal was done, the vehicle was on its way to the state crime lab to be processed for evidence that might lead back to Misty Copsy. Kimberly DeLange or Anna Chibetnoy. Puyallup police's suspicion of Mike Reiner continued to grow as they waited for his car to be processed, which would take forever, by the way. And they started talking to some of Mike Reiner's friends who told them that Mike loved to go four-wheeling and some of his favorite trails were out by the Weyerhaeuser logging road near Highway 410. Sergeant Carver and Mike Madison were getting antsy. They still hadn't spoken to Mike Reiner directly. They really wanted to wait until the state crime lab gave them the results of what was found in his car before they did talk to him. And like I said, it was taking forever because apparently the lab had a backlog, as they always do, and there was nothing that Carver or Madison could do to like speed that up. So while we are also waiting for them to get those results, let's come back to our timeline. Let's return to Corey Bober and see what he's up to because he didn't just dissolve from view when he went to prison. He was still writing and calling Diana. He was still writing and calling the media and the police. And in April, he had sent a very angry letter to Pierce County Detective Tim Coble saying, quote, Mr. Coble, you're pathetic. You, Mr. Kojak wannabe can kiss my ass and get a real job, get a life. A polygraph would prove I'm honest. I dare you to do it. You know I'd pass. Yes, I've got a job too. I'm doing your job. End quote. Which is funny because we know 
that <laughs> Corey Bober was invited to take a polygraph and he like refused. He didn't want to do it. And then he agreed and then he canceled and then he never did take a polygraph. So if he was so sure he would pass, why didn't he take a polygraph? Detective Coble made a note of this seemingly random letter stating, quote, I received a letter from Corey Bober. After reading the letter, I am convinced Corey Bober is mentally unstable. I believe he is an individual who has been unemployed for many years and living at home with his mother. It appears he has nothing constructive to do other than smoke dope and become obsessed with the Green River Killer. It is still unclear at this time why Corey Bober is obsessed with Randy Atchziger as being the Green River Killer and having killed Misty Copsey. End quote. So a few weeks after sending this letter, Corey Bober was having some issues with other inmates who were taunting him and calling him the Green River Killer. And a correctional officer was listening to this happening one day, and he decided to head over and break it up when he heard Corey state, I'm the Green River Killer and a mass murderer. After this, Corey was placed in involuntary protective custody and he was segregated from the general population, landing him in a cell with a man named Joseph Edward Duncan III, who was on his last of 13 years for a sex offense. Corey and Duncan would get along very well while segregated together. Apparently, they hit it off, and Duncan would soon be released. But we aren't finished hearing about him yet because in 2005, after being released, Joseph Edward Duncan III tortured and killed an entire family in Idaho, save for one eight-year-old girl who would survive his attack. And it's interesting that somebody who was so interested in serial killers and crime cases and things like that would be in a cell for an extended period of time with a man who would go on to do this. And Corey Bober was, you know, able to pick out suspects in the Green River Killer case. He was able to predict when victims were going to turn up or go missing, but he couldn't see what was right in front of him inside of a man that he spent a lot of time talking to. And get this, after pleading guilty and being sentenced to death, Duncan also confessed to killing three children in Seattle and California in 1996 and 1997, also after he was released from prison. So I don't see him ever really mentioned as a potential suspect in Misty's case, most likely because he was in prison at the time that Misty went missing. However, it just goes to show you, like, people who do these terrible things, they're out there. In, in great numbers, and sometimes you don't even know what they've done until they get caught for something else, and then they end up confessing. Corey Bober continued reaching out to Diana Copsey through phone calls and letters, telling her that he thought the police were trying to set him up for Misty's murder, and he also was complaining that he was being treated like a crazy person and given psyche valves and all of this. He told her about the incident where the other inmates had been calling him the Green River Killer, and he said he'd responded like, yeah, right, I'm the Green River Killer, but they'd thought he was being serious. In July of 1993, Bober was transferred to a work release in Tacoma, which is when he found out some news that literally breathed new life into him, into his investigation, and into his belief that Randy Atchziger was, in fact, the Green River Killer. Because at the end of March, the previous March, Corey's Green River Killer suspect, Randy Atchziger, had been charged with the rape of two seven-year-old girls in Puyallup. He would eventually plead guilty a year later and take a lesser charge of first-degree molestation. I'm not sure why <laughs> this lesser charge was even on the table for him, but our justice system is so broken, right? It really is. And things like this prove it. It's just so hard to see um, the progression of how these things happen. Like that dude that was in prison with Corey Bober, like why was he ever let out after his first sex crime against children? Why was he allowed to be let out and do it again and then go on to kill an entire family? So anyways, the police officer who responded to this complaint against Randy Atchziger was Detective Tom Madison, who was Sergeant Herm Carver's partner and who was working on Misty's case with Carver. But I guess he apparently didn't feel there was any possible connection between these new charges against Randy Atchziger and what had happened to Misty. By July 15th, the forensic results were still not back from Mike Reiner's car, but Sergeant Carver and Detective Madison set up an interview with him that day anyways, because they just couldn't wait any longer. And Reiner pretty much said the same thing that Trina had said. He picked her up on the road. She told him Misty was going to take the bus home. And he said after dropping Trina off, he went home and called a friend. He was supposed to drive this friend to visit her mother in the hospital in Auburn. I don't know if the police ever 
talked to this friend or verified that that is what Mike Reiner had done that night. If they did, it's not reported anywhere. Reiner said that he and Trina were just friends, right? Um, He would not admit to being her boyfriend, obviously, because it was, like, incredibly illegal. He said he was a listening ear for her when she was having problems at home. And as for Misty Copsey, he'd only met her a handful of times. Once, he'd been at Misty's house. The rest of the times he'd seen her had been at Trina's house. Mike Reiner was on to what the police were doing and what they wanted from him right from the get-go. So he brought up his past charge before they could. He said the complaint against him by this minor girl had just been an allegation. It had never happened, and he'd even gotten a letter telling him that he was cleared. But he knew that the police wanted to talk to him because of that charge. He said he'd been worried the police were going to think he'd hurt Misty because of this juvenile complaint from seven years prior. Now, after this interview, Detective Madison made a note that Reiner had seemed deceptive in many areas, so he had Mike Reiner come in for a polygraph, which Mike passed. And get this, after Mike Reiner passed the polygraph, even before forensics came back from his car, Detective Madison stated in his notes, quote, As Michael Reiner passed the polygraph, he is eliminated at this point of being involved, end quote. And this is not the last time that the Puella police would just eliminate someone as a suspect based simply on the results of their polygraph, which drives me absolutely crazy Because we know polygraph exams are not completely legitimate. They're definitely not enough to eliminate somebody as a suspect. But with Mike Reiner apparently off the table, as far as being a suspect, Puyallup police returned their attention to Ruben Schmidt. According to Detective Madison, information had been received to suggest Ruben may have actually picked Misty up from the fair that night. And Madison kind of makes it sound like this is new information. Like, oh, we've just received this information. But it wasn't because Diana Copsey had known about it since the day after Misty's disappearance. And I'm talking about the details she'd gotten from Ruben's roommate at that time, James Tinsley, where Tinsley said that Ruben and his uncle had in fact left the house to go and pick Misty up from the fair. So Tinsley was interviewed by the police on September 1st, a whole ass six months since Ruben had taken that odd polygraph where he basically zoned out and put himself to sleep and they thought he was being deceptive, and they thought he was purposely, like, shutting down so that he wouldn't set any alarm bells off during the polygraph exam. And James Tinsley said that Reuben and his brothers had crashed with him for a little while after getting kicked out of their place, and they were there at the time of Misty's disappearance, and Misty had called Reuben for a ride on September 17, 1992. According to James, he didn't know whether or not Reuben had enough gas to go and get Misty, but he did know that at the time of Misty's call, Reuben was with a girlfriend, not a friend who was a girl, a girlfriend, romantically, and this girl was 13 years old. I guess the girlfriend got upset when Reuben got the call from Misty, and I guess Reuben had said, oh, maybe we should go pick Misty up talking to this 13-year-old girl, and the girl was like, how dare you? talk about, you know, picking up another girl while you're with me. And she left. And then Ruben himself left the apartment about five or 10 minutes later. Tinsley said this was weird because Ruben would usually tell him that he was leaving. He would usually say him going out. This is where I'm going. But on this night, Ruben just left without a word. And he couldn't be sure, but Tinsley believed Ruben had left sometime between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. Tinsley also said that he knew Ruben could have a very bad temper. He could turn violent. Violent. And after they found out that Misty was missing, Reuben didn't seem worried at all about her. James thought it was possible that Reuben could have come on to Misty. She would have turned him down and then he would have gotten angry. And James Tinsley was asked if he thought that Reuben would try to take advantage of Misty. And Tinsley said, yeah, he thought he would. He also thought that Reuben would be capable of kidnapping and murder. After this, Detective Madison and Sergeant Carver felt they were on to something because Reuben had told them that he'd blacked out after speaking to Misty on the phone, remember? And now they discovered that he had left the apartment and his whereabouts were not accounted for. So going off this new information that they would have had if they'd only talked to James Tinsley the day after Misty's disappearance, the police went to go collect Ruben's vehicle. But surprise, surprise, (laughs) since so much time had passed, it no longer even existed. It was gone. It was brave little toastered. Ruben had sold his green Chevy Nova to a junkyard in March of 1993, and the vehicle had been crushed on June 
24th, just a few months prior. However, both of these dates, when he sold his car and when it was crushed, were after the police had initially interviewed Ruben in March and given him a polygraph during which they thought he seemed to be acting suspicious as if he was trying to beat the machine. If they'd only taken the car back then, the police may have been able to, I don't know, get some forensics out of it, see if Misty had been in the vehicle, see if there's blood in the vehicle, anything. The police were able to speak to Ruben again on September 8th, at which time he admitted that now he actually did remember leaving his apartment, but he didn't remember what he did after because, you know, conveniently timed blackouts. And this is always incredibly suspicious to me when a suspect lies during their initial police interview. So, for instance, Ruben says, oh, um, I do remember getting the call because the police already knew that he'd gotten the call from Misty. But I don't remember what happened after I got the call because I had a blackout. Now police have information from James Tinsley saying that Ruben did leave the apartment. So now Ruben admits to leaving the apartment and he suddenly remembers this because the police already have that information. But they do not have the information about where he went afterwards. And he knows this. So now once again... Well, I can't remember what happened after this information you already know because I had a blackout. So I can't tell you what happened during the time that you have no information for. And if somebody were to come forward and be like, oh, I actually saw Ruben at a gas station after he left the apartment that night, Ruben would be like, ah, you know what? I actually do remember being at that gas station, but ah, damn blackouts. Can't remember what happened after it. That is suspicious to me always. So after admitting to having left the apartment on the night of Misty's disappearance, Reuben was driven to his grandmother's 100-acre farm in Buckley because now Reuben was also saying that he hadn't gone there on the morning of September 18th. He must have gone there on the evening of September 17th. That's what he's saying now. And this begs the question, if what Reuben had claimed was true, that he hadn't had enough gas to drive 16 miles to the fair to pick Misty up, that he didn't even have enough gas to drive an even shorter distance to Misty's house to get gas money. How did he have enough gas to drive from Spanaway to his grandmother's isolated 100-plus acre farm 60 miles away from where he lived? How? Where did he get the gas? Now, referring to the farm that belonged to Ruben's grandmother, Detective Madison made a note saying, quote, This is approximately six plus miles from the river north of Buckley. Ruben thought the clothes were found at the location by the bridge. In actuality, the alleged clothes were several miles further down Highway 410 past Mud Mountain Dam. This was interesting, as he had told his employer that Misty's body was actually buried six to six and a half miles away from the clothes, which would put Misty in the area of his grandmother's farm, end quote. And this seems like a really astute observation. An astute observation that you think would most definitely lead to a search of grandma's farm. But no, it didn't. And the property was never investigated. As far as I can tell, definitely not at that point. Instead of doing actual police work and tracking down actual physical evidence, law enforcement decided to give Ruben Schmidt another polygraph exam, which he passed this time, leading Detective Madison to make a note in the case file that said, quote, it appears that Ruben Schmidt was not involved in the disappearance of Misty Copsey. He, however, has no alibi as to his movements during the evening of her disappearance, as well as no memory. He claimed that he had a blackout. He acknowledges that he left the residence of James Tinsley, but does not remember what he did. End quote. Make it make sense. Please make it make sense. He passed his polygraph, which is in no way a foolproof method of figuring out if someone is lying. But he has no alibi, doesn't remember where he was the night of the murder, lied about leaving the apartment, lied about not having enough gas, and spent the evening allegedly frolicking around a remote 100-acre farm at night alone in the dark. <laughs> Cleared. Cleared. Yeah, definitely. He, he seems to have nothing to do with this. Puyallup police never interviewed Ruben Schmidt again. And as far as I can tell, they never spoke to his grandmother or anyone else who could verify his story of what he had done that night. But he's cleared. It had been a year since 14-year-old Misty Copsey had vanished from Puyallup, and the fair came to town again, bringing in historically high attendance numbers. Another big event that month was that the forensic results of the examination of Mike Reiner's car finally were completed. And the forensic techs had compared evidence that was found on Misty's jeans against material found in Mike Reiner's car, and the results showed there was no match found. On October 26th, the Pierce County Herald 
wrote, quote, other than the length of time Copsy has been missing, Carver said there remains little to support the theory that she was the victim of foul play, end quote. A year after Misty went missing, nobody heard from her. There's all this evidence that people could have potentially been involved in harming her, like Mike Reiner, like Ruben Schmidt. Like any of the serial killers that were operating in that area, taking young girls at that time, Puyallup police were still calling her a missing person and saying there was a little to support the theory that she was the victim of foul play. And Sergeant Carver, who apparently had nothing better to do than talk to the media because he certainly wasn't conducting an investigation, he also went on the Evening Magazine show claiming that the discovery of Misty's jeans had been unhelpful. Carver said, quote, You know, if I was in Diana's shoes, I probably would feel that we were not doing enough either. But, you know, I can get up in the morning and look myself in the mirror. I know what we've done. I've got a clean conscience. End quote. He's a little Delulu, no? Like, what are you talking about? You have a clean conscience and you know what you've done. How could you know what you've done in this case and still have a clean conscience? So, like, whatever subjective reality allows you to look at yourself in the mirror and not feel guilty about not doing enough is not my business. But I think objectively... Anyone would look at what you had done in this investigation and say you probably shouldn't be able to look at yourself in the mirror. Carver also wrote in his notes that the day after the show aired, Diana Copsey had called him and thanked him for being so nice during the show. But he's a dick about the way he writes it, too, in my opinion. So he wrote in his notes, quote, she thanked me for being nice. And I say it like this because he used a question mark and an exclamation point after each sentence. So like, she thanked me, question mark, explanation point, for being nice, question mark, explanation point, which to me translates as, is she stupid? I wasn't being nice. I was basically saying like, she's delusional if she thinks that we haven't done as much as we could because I can look at myself in the mirror every day and know that we did. And maybe he thought Diana was being sarcastic or had some nefarious scheme for thanking him for being nice because a few days later, Carver began interviewing people that Diana knew, such as an ex-boyfriend and her old parole officer. Carver had both of Misty's parents Buck and Diana take polygraphs and they both passed, with Carver noting, quote, Diana is exonerated of any involvement in the disappearance of her daughter, Misty Copsey, end quote. But then this dick, Sergeant Carver, he told Jim Doyan and Jim Corey of the King County Sheriff's Department that he was still skeptical because Diana had scored in the weak zone of truthfulness. What does that mean? But I mean, I guess if there is such a thing as the weak zone of truthfulness, Carver would know his way around that weak zone since that's where he appeared to live 24-7, especially when he's looking at himself in the mirror with a clean conscience. So Jim Corey from the King County Sheriff's Department, he wrote in his notes, quote, Carver believes that possibly Misty's mother was inconclusive on the results of the polygraph because she had something to do with placing the clothing up on Highway 410, which was identified as the clothing Misty was wearing at the time of her disappearance, end quote. Is this dude serious? Is this dude Herm Carver for real? Did Diana pass? Or were the results inconclusive? Because you wrote in your notes, your official case notes, that she passed. But then you're over here gossiping like a little schoolgirl with your, like, law enforcement buddies being like, oh, it was actually inconclusive. So what's the real story? It feels like reaching. It's giving confirmation bias. She passed, but you still can't let go of your suspicion. You still can't let go of the fact that you did not find this evidence because you weren't looking. And so, of course, it had to have been planted. And, of course, it had to have been planted by her. And now you're making up stuff about the weak zone of truthfulness and how her polygraph was inconclusive, even though in your legitimate police notes you wrote that she passed. What's that about? If Herm Carver was willing to tell anyone who would listen that he hadn't pursued Misty's case because there was no evidence she'd encountered foul play, if he was so big on evidence, where was his evidence that Diana Copsey had anything to do with planting Misty's jeans on the highway? So I guess it's okay to die on a hill when your gut instinct is running the show, right? When your gut instinct is like, oh, this girl's just a runaway. And then again, when your gut instinct is like, oh, Diana Copsey planted the, these genes. She planted evidence. But you actually don't legitimately seem to care about what the evidence says. Now, I, I will say I have not personally decided whether or not those genes were planted there. It's possible. But I don't think that Diana Copsey did it. I don't think she did. But if they were planted, 
I would look to the person who had chosen the search location, the person who had arranged the search for evidence that February morning, sure that it would draw his suspect, the Green River Killer, out into the open. And that would be Corey Bober. Maybe Herm Carver had that same thought because he had Corey Bober come in on January 26, 1994, and he asked him to take a polygraph. Which, remember, Bober had written a letter to that other police officer when he was in prison, and he's like, oh, just give me a polygraph. You know I pass it. You know you won't. You know. So why, when Sergeant Herm Carver asks him to take a polygraph, Bober kind of like lost his shit. He was not happy with this suggestion. And he was like, you're crazy if you think that I killed Misty. And then he began to go on a rant about Randy Atchseger before Carver interrupted his tirade to let him know that Atchseger was not even on their radar, but Corey was. Corey was a suspect. That's allegedly what Herm Carver told Corey Bober. Corey Bober eventually calmed down enough to agree to a polygraph exam that was scheduled for March 11th. However, Bober would never take a polygraph because he called the morning of and canceled, writing in his journal that he didn't trust it. Which also, to be perfectly honest, I can't even be mad at that. It seemed that the Puyallup police used these lie detector tests to just confirm their own narratives, th- th- to just confirm what they already believed. And honestly, with his interaction with Herm Carver, with the Puyallup police, I probably wouldn't trust anything they had to do either. But then I would also say you probably shouldn't be all high and mighty about it, writing letters to police officers being like, give me a polygraph. You know you won't. Do it. Do it. I dare you. Like, don't do that if you don't trust them to actually give you a polygraph because then it makes you look inconsistent. It makes you look a little suspicious. So another polygraph test was never scheduled for Corey Bober. And I'll also give you a little foreshadowing because years later, police were able to find the DNA of an unidentified male on Misty's jeans. I believe it was just a partial DNA sample. But Corey Bober would refuse to give a DNA sample to compare against that. But we'll talk a little bit more about this later. On February 22nd, 1994, the King County Sheriff's Office closed the case on Misty Copsey, Kimberly DeLange, and Anna Chibetnoy. And for the next nine years, Misty's case went cold. Every single year, Diana Copsey went to the Puyallup Fair wearing a t-shirt with her daughter's face on it, passing out flyers with Misty's information. And as time passed, she focused on trying to get her life back together after the loss of Misty had ripped it to shreds. In 1996, Diana started going to AA meetings to get her drinking under control. She started going to therapy, and she started writing her thoughts down in a journal. One of these journal entries from that year really affected me. Diana wrote that she had a dream where she was cleaning an apartment one evening. And she said, quote, I got done cleaning the bathroom and turned the corner to go to the living room. It was pretty dark, but I saw someone sitting on the couch. As soon as I saw her, I knew it was Misty. She opened her arms and said, Mommy. I grabbed her and just held her there forever, end quote. Like, can you imagine having this dream and then waking up from the dream alone in the bed you used to snuggle your child in? You wake up alone to find that your child is not in your arms at all. And this will be followed by the vivid and cold realization that she probably never would be again. When I read that journal entry, it really just, it really affected me. Like I kind of started welling up a little bit, like I had some tears and it really kind of just like slammed me right into the shoes of Diana Copsey. And if what Diana was going through and had been going through for a decade wasn't bad enough, she couldn't even count on Misty's own father as an ally. Buck Copsey apparently believed that Misty was a runaway, and he said as much in March of 1996 around what would have been Misty's 18th birthday. In her journal, Diana wrote, quote, 31096, today is Misty's birthday. She would be 18. I know she would be a beautiful 18-year-old. Anyway, I can hardly believe how deep in denial Buck is staying. Evening Magazine did a piece on Misty again the other night saying a family member was expecting a big break in the case this week. Well, it was Buck saying he's expecting a phone call from Misty. They also had a piece in the paper saying the same thing. Needless to say, Misty didn't call. God, I miss her, end quote. Diana was referring to Buck's comments made in a News Tribune story that claimed the Puyallup police were still leaning towards the runaway theory. Buck Copsey said, quote, I'm hoping she's going to call me. When she turns 18, she's no longer a child. Nobody can force her to do anything she doesn't want to do, end quote. Thankfully, King County investigator Jim Doyen acted as a voice of reason in the same article, stating, quote, my professional instincts lead me to believe 
but she's more than likely deceased. There are some people out there <clears throat> looking at you, Herm Carver and Buck Copsey, who believe she just took off and is living somewhere, somehow, without any contact with any law enforcement agency. But reality tells me that given the circumstances, the timing and location of her disappearance, there's a high probability she's the victim of foul play. There are people out there who are getting away with murder. The Misty Copsey case is one of them. End quote. Additionally, Detective Roger Cox of the Puyallup Police Department claimed that the investigation into Misty's disappearance was on hold until Misty's 18th birthday passed. He said if she didn't call, they would start going back over the case file and re-interviewing people, like covering their tracks again. But according to the News Tribune, who gained access to the Puyallup Police files on Misty's case, there was no evidence and no mention of this ever being done. Like, no sign that the Puyallup police were going back over Misty's case and re-interviewing people after her 18th birthday passed. In April of 1997, Corey Bober was arrested again and hit with four charges of dealing marijuana, but this time Corey came to court prepared because he'd managed to obtain the Washington State Patrol crime lab report that had been done on Misty's jeans in 1993. According to the News Tribune, quote, it was an absurd coup. The lab report was part of an active criminal investigation legally exempt from public disclosure. Reporters and private citizens, even Diana, couldn't have obtained it if they tried. Yet Bober, a pot-smoking amateur and high school dropout, had pried it loose. End quote. Using this lab report as proof, I guess, Bober told the jury that he was a citizen investigator researching the Green River killer case and the police were trying to shut him up. And apparently this defense worked and Corey was acquitted. Not only that, but he now had the lab report. And the report stated that there was no blood or semen found on Misty's jeans, but there had been dirt, six hairs, some fibers, and three small red paint chips. And of course, Corey Bober thought he knew where those paint chips had come from, his Green River killer suspect, Andy Atchsiger, of course, who'd been driving a red Porsche. It was actually a Porsche that he'd painted red at the time of Misty's disappearance. Bober made a note in his journal to track down the new owner of the Porsche who lived in Linwood so that the paint of the car could be compared against the red paint chips found on Misty's jeans. By the year 2000, Puyallup police were still calling Misty a runaway. There were still no new leads and something deep inside Diana Copsey realized that her daughter was never coming home. In May, Diana requested that the Pierce County Medical Examiner declare Misty legally dead so that she could hold a memorial service, say goodbye to her only child, and have a place to return to so that she could talk to Misty and mourn properly. The medical examiner, Dr. John Howard, initially refused. He said, there was no body, there's no evidence that Misty's even dead. But Diana wouldn't budge. She said, I know she's dead. Stop playing games with me. Y'all are driving me crazy. Keep telling me she's going to pop up and come home any time now. She's not. I want to mourn my child. So on May 19th, Misty Copsey's death certificate was issued. And since she had no money to put together a memorial service, Corey Bober actually stepped in. He took it off her hands. He convinced a Parkland church to host the service free of charge. And he managed to get local florists to donate flowers. After she was finally allowed to properly say goodbye to Misty, Diana was still not done fighting for answers and for justice. She told the media that the Puyallup Police Department had dropped the ball several times, and she put out a call to action. Science had progressed quite a bit since the discovery of Misty's jeans in 1993. Diana wanted the hairs that were found on the jeans to be analyzed. She wanted DNA tests done. She wanted answers, which is another, to me, piece of evidence that shows Diana did not plant those jeans there because if she had, she wouldn't be so gung-ho on forensic evidence from those genes being examined because she would know that that forensic evidence would not lead to the actual person who had taken Misty. But apparently, Buck Copsey, Misty's father, was personally offended by his ex-wife's public declarations, and on May 24th, he allegedly went to the police department to complain and commiserate about it. According to a Puyallup police report, quote, Buck was upset with what Diana had stated to the media and upset with the Tribune's article that bashed the police. Buck still believes that Misty is alive and that she just got sick of it and went underground. He believes that Misty ran away because of the poor relationship that she had with her mother. Buck told me that he thinks a conversation 
conversation he had with Misty two or three weeks prior to her disappearance may have caused her to leave. At that time, Buck told Misty the truth about why he had left Diana years prior. He said that he told Misty that Diana was a friggin' alcoholic and other things. Buck feels now that he was too honest with his daughter and may have caused her to stage her disappearance. End quote. This is so stupid. This is so stupid. <laughs> no one else in Misty's life said that she had a strained relationship with her mother. Not her friends, not, you know, Diana Copsy herself. Diana had just bought her a new stereo the day before she disappeared. Misty was so grateful, so happy about it. Diana let her borrow her new jeans that night. It seemed that they had a normal relationship that a teenage girl would have with their mother, where it was kind of push and pull, but overall, nothing that's going to make Misty all of a sudden overnight be like, oh my God, I hate my mother. I can't even stand to be in her presence anymore. She's an alcoholic. Once again, this was not something that Misty didn't know. She knew that her mother struggled with alcohol from time to time. So I, I don't see why Buck Copsey is insisting on being so delusional to the point where he is just helping to confirm the narrative the bias that the Puyallup police have of calling Misty a runaway for, for years and years and years instead of doing something like Diana was doing to prompt the police to actually find what had happened to Misty, what had happened to his daughter. Like, I just don't, I don't understand it. On November 30th, 2001, Gary Leon Ridgway was arrested, and just like that, the Green River Killer was off the streets for good, even though you couldn't convince Corey Bober of that fact. Even two years later, when Ridgway confessed to 48 murders and was able to lead police to some of the bodies of his victims, Corey still didn't want to hear it. Ridgway would eventually be connected of 48 separate murders, but as part of his plea bargain, another conviction was added, bringing the total to 49. In a December 2003 interview with detectives, Ridgway did claim that he believed he'd murdered as many as 71 women, but he had lost track over time and didn't remember where he'd left all of their bodies. In 2003, Ridgway started leading investigators to the bodies of his victims who were still missing, and this led to the discovery of four new victims. Now, during that summer, King County detectives drove Ridgway up and down Highway 410 so that he could tell them if he had left any of his victims in that area and they did this more than once. During these drives, the detectives repeatedly drove past the gates, the entrance to Waco Road, just east of Mile Post 30, where Misty's jeans had been located in 1993, and where the bodies of Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chabatnoy had been found. Gary Ridgway never identified the area, even though the police did slow down and point it out to him. On June 21, 2003, Detective Tom Jensen asked Ridgway if he'd ever gone through the Weyerhaeuser gates and onto the Weyerhaeuser property, and Ridgway responded, no, the gates were always locked up. Jensen responded, yeah, they're locked now, but were they always? And Ridgway responded, quote, they were locked up then too, because I was going to go over there, you know, a place to hide them, end quote. A DNA analysis would later rule Ridgway out as the killer of Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibetnoy. But because Ridgway worked as a car painter, the red paint chips found on Misty's jeans were still of interest to law enforcement. In the fall of 2003, shortly before Ridgway's conviction, King County hired a private lab in Illinois called Microtrace to run an analysis on spray paint spheres found on some of the Green River Killer's victims' clothing. Microtrace analyzed paint gathered from Ridgway's home, vehicle, and workplace to create a reference library, and then they compared it to the paint fragments collected in or around the dump sites where victims were found. When the results came back no match, the lab decided to vacuum dust from Ridgway's clothing as well as the clothing of his victims, and they then analyzed these tiny particles under a microscope equipped with an infrared device that was used to detect colors and compositions of substances. This process found that paint spheres on Ridgway's clothing were also found on the clothing of five of his victims. The red paint chips found on Misty's clothing were included in these tests, but they were found to not be a match to Gary Ridgway. The debris from DeLange and Chibetnoy were also compared to the debris from Misty's jeans, and there was nothing found that connected them. So nothing that was found on Misty's jeans connected her to anything that was found on the bodies or the crime scenes of Anna Chibetnoy and Kimberly DeLange. Now, there has been recent reporting that claims these paint chips that were found on Misty's jeans, they were not from a vehicle at all. They were more likely red nail polish. I don't know where that information came from, but it's really hard to sort of support that now or to prove that it was nail polish and not paint chips 
because the paint chips that were found on Misty's jeans are gone. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So Gary Ridgway has always said that he would cooperate with law enforcement to track down victims. But he also said that he would never take credit for victims that were not his. And he didn't do this out of like some moral compass of like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, ruin an investigation or prevent you from finding the real person who did this. He said it was because killing women was his career. He took a lot of pride in it, and he didn't want to take that credit and glory away from anybody else. That's what he said. And Ridgway also firmly denies taking any girls from Puyallup. It is unlikely that Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, was responsible for Misty's disappearance. And police records show that he also worked a full shift at his truck painting job on September 17th, 1992, the day that Misty disappeared. If you want to know more about the Green River Killer, you can go to Tubi and watch this uh, documentary done on the Green River Killer that your girl Stephanie Harlow happens to be in. So I'll link that in the description box. In 2005, Tamara P. Hill of the Puyallup Police visited Diana Copsey to talk with her about Misty's case. Now, at this time, when Tamara visited Diana, Corey Bober was harassing law enforcement to follow another one of his theories, that Misty was buried in Eatonville, where Randy Atchsiger had been living in a trailer at the time of her abduction. The location had once been a vacant lot, but it had been purchased by a man named Oscar Pierce who had built a house there and then poured concrete for a driveway, and Bober thought that Misty was buried under the driveway. So with his usual and uncanny ability to get people to do what he wanted, Corey Bober was able to convince a private company to conduct a ground-penetrating survey on the property for no charge, and Corey taunted the Puyallup police, telling them that they could come and watch it happen since they weren't interested in investigating themselves. But Oscar Pierce the owner of the property was not on board, and he told the News Tribune a few years later in 2007, quote, I know for a fact that she's not there. I even had a backhoe. I dug up around here eight feet deep, never hit anything, end quote. But Oscar Pierce did have something interesting to say, though, because when Corey Bober had started poking around, he'd called the Pierce County Sheriff's Office to ask about Corey, and they told him, you know, Corey's nuts, ignore him. But then Oscar Pierce told the paper, quote, all I know is the Pierce County Sheriff deputies said the Puyallup cops screwed up that investigation big time, end quote, which is not something we didn't know, obviously, but it's interesting to hear that one law enforcement agency would openly say that to somebody about another law enforcement agency, which lets you know that it has to be bad and it has to be obvious. So when Tamara of the Puyallup Police Department went to see Diana Copsey in 2005, she thought she was being reassuring when she told Diana that there was still hope. You know, there's no evidence that Misty was even dead. It's possible that she's still alive. But this had the opposite effect, instead causing Diana to become extremely angry and triggering her to write a letter to the state patrol chief, John Batiste. Quote, Puyallup is still operating under the premise that Misty is alive and well. That feels like some kind of inhumane torture when I hear that. Please override the Puyallup Police Department and take this case away from them. I am asking you to now enact your jurisdictional authority over the Puyallup police and seize this investigation in its entirety, end quote. But of course, the state patrol was like, nope, request denied. This case is a mess. We don't even know where we would start. Let the Puyallup Police Department clean up its own mess. They didn't actually say all that other stuff. They just said no, but I'm assuming that that's what they were probably thinking. Next, Corey Bober was in Diana's ear about those red paint chips on Misty's jeans. Had he not told her that Randy Atchsiger drove a red Porsche at the time of Misty's disappearance? Didn't it make sense for the police to compare the paint of that car to the paint chips found on Misty's clothing? At least it would eliminate something. At least it would tell them something. At least they'd be doing something. So Diana then started calling the police and suggesting that they do that. And in September of 2005, Pua police officer Lieutenant Dave McDonald collected several samples from the car, including red paint chips from the front and rear trunk area, as well as carpet samples and some hairs found inside the car. Now, according to police records, the paint samples from the Porsche were given to King County. And King County already had the paint chips from Misty's jeans. And then King County sent the paint samples from the red Porsche and the paint chips from Misty's jeans to the state crime lab in Tacoma. And they wanted those two things to be compared. Now, of course, the crime lab had a year-long backlog, as they always do. So Corey Bober and everyone else would have to wait for the results. But when the report was finished on January 16th, 2007, it stated, quote, no fibers 
or paint fragments that could have originated from the Porsche 914 were recovered from the jeans, underpants, or socks of Misty Copsey, end quote. But there was a problem, right? Because the tech who had written the report making these claims seemed to maybe not have been completely upfront. Terry McAdam had already tested the hair and debris from the Porsche against the evidence on Misty's jeans, but when he went to run the paint chips from Misty's jeans and compare it to the paint chips against the Porsche, he found that the bag that had once held the paint chips from Misty's jeans was completely empty. He said there's like a little bit of plastic in there, and that was all no paint chips. The last known location of the paint chips had been the Micro Trace Lab. They'd been sent there in 2003 for a Green River Killer comparison. Micro Trace President Skip Palinak told the News Tribune that he was confident the paint chips had been returned to King County, but nobody really knows where they were. And I guess there was a lab fire at Microtrace in 2008, so if they were there, they probably aren't there anymore. But this, once again, brings up the question, why did Terry McAdam write in his 2007 report that no fibers or paint fragments could tie Miss Decopsy to Randy Atchsiger's red Porsche? Why did he say that when he wouldn't be able to possibly know, with the paint samples at least. But it appeared that the Puyallup police were working on a lead, and that lead was Ruben Schmidt, who Lieutenant Dave McDonald made a note of in March of 2006, stating, quote, I think it's worth taking another shot at Schmidt, and we're planning on it. He's been clean since 1993, end quote. Which, as it turns out, once again, was not exactly true. According to the News Tribune, they found files from the Pierce County Sheriff's Office that stated Reuben had been accused of rape in early 1996. The victim was one of Misty's friends, and according to this girl, Reuben had held a pillow over her face to silence her. It was also discovered that Reuben's wife had requested a domestic violence protection order against him in November of 2006. The report states, quote, Reuben has previously told her that if she ever had him served with a court order, Order, he'd one, burn her house down with her and her kids in it, and two, send some guys to kick in her door and take money from her. She said Reuben told her that they'd get money from her if they had to beat her, rape her, and then rob her. She said Reuben told her that if it came to that, she wouldn't be breathing when they were done with her. End quote. Sounds like a super nice guy. Now, I want to talk about the six hairs that were found on Misty Copsey's jeans. For some reason, although technology had advanced to a point where it would be possible, DNA testing had never been done on those hairs, which a crime lab report had stated were suitable for DNA testing in August of 2006. The crime lab report said one hair was suitable for nuclear DNA analysis and the others for mitochondrial DNA analysis. So they're all suitable to be tested for DNA. And according to the state crime lab, they never did these tests because neither the Puyallup Police Department or the King County Sheriff's Office, which was the agency that had collected the hairs, had requested the test to be done. In 2009, the Puyallup Police Department retrieved this evidence from King County and sent the hairs to the state crime lab for analysis. A News Tribune article from June 4, 2009, that was titled, Puyallup Requested the DNA Test Already, talks about how the Puyallup Police had known for two years that the six hairs found were suitable for DNA testing, so why were they waiting to have them tested? Valid question. The Puyallup Police Department spokesperson claimed that they were worried that the DNA test could lead nowhere. It could show the hairs had come from Misty or from her mother Diana, and that wouldn't get them any closer to finding out what had happened to Misty. That is why it hasn't been a priority, which once again makes absolutely no sense because you've got no physical evidence in this case. And yes, the hair on the jeans could be Misty's or could be Diana's, but they could be somebody else's, and then you would have a lead to go on. You can't just sit there with the case cold being like, we have no new leads to go on when you're not doing DNA testing on potential physical evidence. It makes absolutely no sense. The spokesperson also made a comment, which I think is more telling about why they have not done this DNA testing by now. And he said the discovery of the genes was still suspicious. They were still concerned that the genes had been planted in an effort to force a deeper investigation. Quote, it's unfortunate in the manner that the find was found because it involved Corey Bober. It's unfortunate even if it is a legitimate dumping, end quote. And he's saying it's unfortunate because, like, there could have been, you know, tainting done to the evidence. Like, did Corey touch them? He always said he didn't touch them. But did anybody touch them? We don't know because the police didn't find them. But still, if you have nothing else to go on, why wouldn't you test the hairs as soon as you found out they were viable for DNA testing in 2006? Well, the hairs were finally tested, and they did not match Misty 
or her mother, Diana, or anyone else in the FBI's database as of now. But the DNA profile of a male was found on Misty's genes. It's unclear of whether that DNA profile was found from like touch DNA or whether the DNA profile was pulled from the hair. I know this seems like such a simple fact that should be easy to find, but I really couldn't ever nail it down. Like nobody ever said it very distinctly enough for me to know for sure. So there is hope that one day there could be a hit in the system, that one day maybe somebody gets arrested or something happens and they have a match to the DNA. Now, it looks like police did speak to Ruben again after the News Tribune three-part series went out and sort of lit a fire underneath law enforcement to retrace the steps of those who came before them, the negligent, ignorant, lazy cops like Sergeant Herm Carver who had come before them. And it has been reported that Ruben cooperated and agreed to give a blood sample, although investigators have not disclosed the details of what Ruben Schmidt said or what they found, such as whether or not his blood matched the DNA profile on Misty's genes. An old lead that looked as if it had never been pursued also popped up after the investigation was given new eyes. And this was a tip that had come in on March 22, 1993, to the King County Sheriff's Office. A man had called in and claimed that he'd seen Misty get into a car with another man the night of the Puyallup Fair. And this person who wanted to remain anonymous claimed he had just returned from Alaska after he'd been out of town for several months. And the news coverage of Misty's case had caused him to remember what he'd seen the previous September. He said... First of all, he said he knew the person in the car, and the car was a yellow Chrysler Cordoba, and Misty had leaned in to talk to the driver, and then she got a startled look on her face. She kind of glanced around, and then she got into the car. The tipster said that the person in the car was a convicted sex offender who worked at a local auto detailing shop that this anonymous man was a customer of, and it looks as if King County investigators did research the background of this person, and they passed the information on to the Puyallup Police Department, But no one from either agency ever interviewed that sex offender, not until the case was reopened. The offender, when he was spoken to years and years later, denied involvement. But police found out he was 33 when Misty vanished, and he'd been convicted in 1990 of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old relative. And in September of 1992, he'd been released from prison. So he was out and on the streets when Misty went missing. He was also known to have personal ties to the fair. He worked numerous odd jobs and drove several vehicles, but with so much time passing and the man denying having anything to do with Misty's disappearance, law enforcement ran into another dead end because what are they going to do over a decade later? Go back and check his alibi? Talk to the people who knew him or saw him that night? He could easily say like, no, I didn't kill any girl, but I can't tell you what I was doing on September 17th, 1992. That was like over 10 years ago. How could I tell you that? And they literally can't do anything about it. They can't be like, yes, you do remember. Tell us so we can check your alibi. He doesn't have to say anything other than he didn't do it, and they can't prove otherwise. So let's examine the suspects. Obviously, in my opinion, Ruben Schmidt is pretty high on the list because I think he had means, motive, and opportunity, and I'm already side-eyeing any 18-year-old man who's sexually interested in a 15-year-old girl, and there are reports and evidence that Ruben had a temper and the potential to get violent. The changing stories, the alleged inconvenient blackouts, the 100-acre farm where his grandmother lived that he happened to visit the night of Misty's disappearance, even though he didn't have enough gas to pick Misty up from the fair, the fact that he said he didn't leave the house to pick Misty up that night but it turns out that he did leave the house and the constant mention of Reuben and his uncle. James Tinsley said Reuben and his uncle went to pick Misty up. Reuben's boss, Frank Rodriguez, claims Reuben bragged about knowing where Misty was buried, doing something to Misty with his uncle. Now, what do we know about this uncle? According to the News Tribune, this man's name, picture, vehicle description, and other information does appear in the Puyallup police records of Misty's investigation. But it does not appear that this man was ever interviewed. The police records mention Ruben's uncle five times between 1993 and 2006 as someone with possible information. But they didn't talk to him or look into his movements on certain key dates. The News Tribune did look into the man and found that he lived a few blocks away from Ruben. And his description and the description of the vehicle he was driving at the time correspond with the man that Diana saw Ruben with when she was confronting him at the grocery store and he, like, jumped into an orange car and drove away. Also, the description of this man corresponds with Frank Rodriguez's description of a man that was, like, tall and lanky. So we don't know if it was really Ruben's uncle or somebody he 
he just referred to as his uncle. We don't know who this person is. The News Tribune does know, but they've decided to not release his name for obvious reasons. But I think that Ruben is probably good for this. And if it was anybody who knew Misty that took her that night, in my opinion, it was Ruben Schmidt. Now, if the jeans that were found on Highway 410 did in fact belong to Misty, if they were the ones she was wearing at the time of her disappearance, then it's very likely that she was another victim of the same person who killed Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibatnoy, a person that has been referred to as the Hi-Ho Killer because the shopping center that Kimberly and Anna were taken from was the Hi-Ho Shopping Center. Since there's basically no information about Kimberly and Anna's cases out there, there's a little hope of figuring out who their murderer was and if that same person is responsible for taking Misty. But there is one suspect that I do lean towards very heavily, and that's a man named Robert Leslie Hickey. On Sunday, January 10th, 1993, less than four months after Misty went missing, Hickey grabbed a 15-year-old girl off the road about five blocks from the Puyallup Fairgrounds. She was walking home on Meridian, which, remember, is where Misty had been seen walking by some eyewitnesses. This is the main road in Puyallup. And Hickey pulled up to her in his red Camaro. The girl ran, but Hickey pursued her. He held a knife to her throat. He forced her into his vehicle. He drove her to an isolated area, raped her, and then pulled her to the side of the roadside overlooking a deep ravine. When the girl told Hickey that she just wanted to go home, he responded that she would tell. She would tell on him like the rest of them. And then he tossed her off the cliff. Luckily, she survived, and Robert Leslie Hickey was arrested five days later. He was convicted of rape and sentenced to seven years in prison. After he was released, Hickey struck again, this time attempting to snatch a 24-year-old woman off the road in Lakewood. She ran. He pursued her. He pushed her down a 15-foot embankment, at which point he ripped her shirt. He was trying to rape her. He told her to shut up or he would kill her. But then Hickey noticed that the woman had dialed 911 on her phone, and she'd already hit send. And so he kind of figured out the police police ran away, so he ran, but he was tracked down and arrested again. In 1993, after his first known crime, Hickey's name appears in the case notes of Misty Copsey's investigation, but no one from law enforcement spoke to him at that time. Even though I would say the M.O., especially of his first victim, matched up pretty closely to what happened to Misty. In 2010, Puyallup police did interview him in prison, but he denied having anything to do with Misty Copsey, which of course he would, because he was only in prison for like an attempted assault, and he wasn't in there for life. He wasn't, you know, on death row, so why would he admit <laughs> to a crime that would give him more time? I mean, I think it's almost a moot point at this at this juncture to even bother asking him. And lastly, Corey Bober has always been a wild card in this case, a big question mark. He did refuse to take a polygraph. He did refuse to give a DNA sample for comparison, but he was very paranoid and he didn't trust the police. So that kind of behavior is, I guess, sort of to be expected. Now, did Corey Bober actually predict that Misty would be taken? Did he actually lead a search party to the discovery of the only piece of physical evidence in her case? Was he responsible for planting the genes? And does that mean everyone has been looking in the wrong place for decades? He could have easily purchased a pair of genes similar or exactly the same to the ones that Diana had bought. Diana had most likely told him where she purchased them from. It was printed in the paper, and they were they were pretty much new when Misty wore them. So the shop that she bought them for might have still had them in stock. So is it possible that he could have bought a pair of jeans, made them look all muddy, made them look all kind of like weathered, and then put them in that spot? Was he so desperate to be taken seriously that he would go to those lengths to make law enforcement think that he was a valuable asset in their investigation? Maybe. I can't tell you whether or not he planted those genes there, but I do know Corey Bober also has a pretty solid alibi for the night of Misty's disappearance. First of all, Corey Bober never had a driver's license. He never had a car, so it would be pretty difficult for him to get to the place where Misty was. And on the night of Misty's disappearance, Bober claims he was assaulted by a neighbor, and the Puyallup police actually did respond to this incident, and the police report was filed at 1.30 a.m. on September 18th, 1993, just a few hours after Misty was last seen. So it's unlikely that Corey Bober was involved with Misty's abduction, but it is for me Still a very big question mark as to whether or not he planted those genes there because he said that Misty was going to be found in the same area as Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibetnoy's bodies were found. And then all of a sudden her genes were there, but her body wasn't found there. So if it was the same person who took Anna and Kimberly, 
why would that person leave the genes there but not leave Misty's body there? And I don't think that the person would have gone in and removed Misty's body because, like I said, they brought in, like, scent dogs and they investigated that area and they didn't find any sign of Misty's. So it's just very hard to believe that, I guess, that the, the jeans and even the underwear and the sock were there just the whole time for months and months and nobody found them and um, nothing ever came of it and Misty's body wasn't there. It just doesn't really make a ton of sense. I hope he didn't plant them because that means everything that was found on those genes, the fibers, the hair, the DNA, none of that has any relevance to what actually happened to Misty Copsey, which means that anyone who's been eliminated based on the presence of their DNA not being on Misty's genes has been wrongly eliminated and needs to be relooked at. It's just a very difficult kind of situation to look at objectively and say, yeah, those genes probably were there the whole time. And I just don't know how I feel about it. But tell me in the comments what you feel about it. Like, do you think the genes were there the whole time? Or do you think that it's possible Corey Bober or even someone else who maybe was trying to mess with Corey put those genes there? I don't know. But basically, that's where we are today. The Puyallup police have tried to do damage control. They've tried to, like, put a lot of effort into finding Misty and, you know, redoing the investigation since they were called out in the News Tribune. But nothing's really led to anything. Uh, there was a point that they put Misty's face on a bus and that drove around. There was a point they did this, like, honestly, really cool social media campaign where they made a Twitter account for Misty. I know it's called X now, but I'm not calling it that. That's so stupid. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. So they made a Twitter account for Misty and then they started tweeting as if it was Misty to like bring attention to her case. So she'd say things like, you know, today's my birthday or this is a picture of me from when I used to hang out on my grandparents' farm and where am I? If you have any information about where I am, like please call the police, et cetera, et cetera. So they did that for a little while. That didn't work. There was a time that they started asking anybody who'd been at the Puel Fair on September 17th, 1992 to send them any photographs they took that day. And, you know, people did have some photographs and they did give them to the police. As far as I know, nothing has come from it. And this case is completely cold. But once again, I don't believe that it would be had the Puyallup police done their job from the first day instead of just saying that a very vulnerable little 14-year-old girl who had no reason to run away, who had no money, who did not contact friends or family for months and years after her disappearance was just a runaway. And that was their validation or that was their justification for not trying to find her and protect her and keep her safe. So that's where we are. What do you think about all this? Let me know in the comment section. You know, I love to hear from you guys. But before we go, we have Stephanie's Small Business Showcase Woohoo! And today's small business showcase comes to us from Q the Vacation. So Eric wrote me and said, my wife Brittany regularly watches your YouTube channel and she read a post of yours that she forwarded to me regarding showcasing small businesses. I think it's a great idea personally and I'm always about promoting others myself. My wife and I together own a travel agency that we started in March of this year called Q the Vacation. Q the Vacation is a veteran-owned full-service travel agency and is dedicated to providing exceptional vacation booking and planning services. Our expertise is Disney, cruises, all-inclusive resorts, and romantic getaways and this allows us to cater to our clients specific needs and preferences from airline tickets and car rentals to theme park tickets and hotel accommodations. We handle all the details to ensure our clients have a hassle-free and unforgettable vacation experience. We pride ourselves on providing personalized service and expert advice to help our clients make the most of their vacation time with their loved ones. And I love this because I will say as somebody who's been to Disney and Universal Studios and stuff a couple of times and who likes to go to all-inclusive resorts, it is so much better and such a more you know streamlined process, so much easier to use a travel agency to help you with those things because they have so much experience with these resorts and they they know exactly where to go to, who to talk to, and, and it basically just takes everything off of you. So when you're busy and you're trying to plan a vacation to get away for a little bit, the last thing that you can do or want to do is take time away from your already busy schedule to plan this vacation that is supposed to help you relax because when you're planning a vacation, you realize it does not help you relax. It's very stressful and you're always worried that you miss something. And these travel agents, they just put everything together for 
you. They send you your itinerary. They send you everything that you need. And all you have to do is like follow their directions, which I love. So I definitely think that you guys should check out Eric and Brittany at Q the Vacation. I'm going to put all of their information in the description box. Check it out. I know personally that um, I'm going to CrimeCon at the end of this month. And then afterwards, I'm going to go to Universal Studios with Adam and the kids for a little while. And we're going to go to um, Halloween Horror Nights and all that. I'm so excited. And I planned that myself. And I didn't have time for it. And I'm definitely stressed out because I know I probably forgot things. And it's going to be st- stressful and kind of already on the the back of like going to CrimeCon. It's going to I'm going to have forgotten something that's going to be like important. So I'm, I'm already stressed about that. I wish that I had gotten this email before I planned this trip because then I would have just called Eric and Brittany and been like, hey, guys, help us out here. Hook a girl up here. So check them out. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. I got blood, blood on the strings